Go ahead. I said I had a few. I know you did. All right, well. I'm waiting. All right. Uh, you sort of uh, said that we were foolish because we thought, some of us had raised our hand, that the universe has uh, is infinite. Yeah. Okay. The observable universe has a boundary. I don't think it does. Let me explain to you why. Go on. I think it does. Go okay. on. Uh, maybe the uh, observable, the observable universe. That's what I said. Has a boundary. That's what I but said. But the universe <coughs> is boundless. That's just a guess, and it's not a good one. Why is it a good one? I'll tell you why. Because if the separation between the perceiver and the perceived is zero. Your argument falls through. Oh, I don't believe that at all. I know you don't. <laughs> I really don't. I think that might be, uh, that might, you might be able to show that mathematically, but it certainly doesn't work in reality. Now, be careful. <laughs> <laughs> You're assuming more than you can chew. <laughs> How am I doing that? Well, you see. You can ask questions from various standpoints, but you can't always answer the questions that are asked from various standpoints. Because if the questions are asked from the wrong standpoint, the answer can't come. There is that difficulty. But you see, if this universe is like a dream, it exists in the dreamer. If what exists is changeless, infinite, and undivided, and I feel perfectly sure that it is, that behind what we see is the changeless, the infinite, the undivided, Otherwise, you have no way to explain the physics. If what behind what we see is not changeless, bicycles certainly wouldn't coast. And if it's not infinite, then the teeny little particles would not have to be electrical. And if it's not undivided, things would not have to fall together. So it seems to me that that's a fairly sure proposition, that what's behind what we see is changeless, infinite, and undivided. Now, if it's undivided, if it's undivided, there's only one of us. You said infinite. I didn't say the universe is infinite. I said what we mistake for the universe is infinite. There's a hell of a difference. Don't get mad at me. I sure I'll get mad at you. I can't conceive of a finite universe. That's your own problem. Whether you can conceive of it or not conceive of it, tells you nothing about the universe. It tells you about your ability to conceive. <laughs> I, I think that the universe... You can't think that it, has a, that it has a boundary out there because then who painted the other side of the fence? There isn't. And you can't think that it doesn't have a boundary because then it goes on forever and you can't handle that either. I can handle that. It goes on forever. All right. <laughs> Mass. What? what oh, the dark matter. That's a good question. The dark matter is a very good question. When, what we know about star clusters is that when a cluster of stars forms from a cloud, something like 95% of the cloud gets blown away by the stellar winds. Now, I've asked this question to, th for, to three professional astronomers within the last 12 years or so. Two of them said that they thought that between 1% and 10% would make into the stars, and the rest would be blown away, but they didn't have a number on it. The last person I asked was at Caltech, and he right away said 95%, in some cases more, in some cases less, is blown away. So when a galaxy forms, we have the same problem. Something like 95% is going to be blown out of the galaxy, and it's going to be in the surrounding region, what I call the hovering layer. Now, it has to be ordinary matter, or it couldn't be blown out. Now, the Big Bang model has this spooky notion that most of the stuff in this universe responds to gravity only, and not to electromagnetism or anything else. It responds only to gravity. If that were really the nature of the dark matter, it would all fall into the galaxies. We know it didn't fall into the galaxies. It's around the galaxies in my hovering layers. Yes. Do you think the observable universe is the only universe, that, or is it possible that there is another that defies the laws of physics? As we when you're dreaming, you have only one dream to face. You don't have to face a plurality of dreams. <laughs> I don't see any any need for for uh, Everett's many worlds hypothesis. I don't see any need for that. 
but I cannot take the universe as actual. Actual would mean that it arises by action. It means that it arises by a process in physics. But all the processes in physics are covered by the conservation laws. And you can never get anything out that you didn't put in. And to hell with the Big Bang. <laughs> <laughs> that should be a t-shirt. <laughs> it should, to hell with the Big Bang. There isn't any photon of light. Let me give it to you straight. In 1905, Einstein changed the geometry from 3D to 4D. And in his 4D geometry, space and time are a pair of opposites. And always for a photon, the total separation, the total space-time separation between the emission event and the absorption event is zero. Nobody ever saw a photon. Haven't you wondered about it? <laughs> All we know about radiation is the emission event and the absorption event. And they have zero separation in space-time. Space separations are not objective. Time separations are not objective. The only separation that's objective is space-time separation. And between the emission and absorption event for a single photon, it always goes to zero. When Einstein threw out the luminiferous ether, he should have had the decency to throw out the photons that swam in it. <laughs> what? The speed of light is not the speed of anything. The speed of light is the ratio of space to time. One light year is equal to one year. One centimeter is equal to a jiffy. <laughs> the, the photon doesn't have any mass. It doesn't exist. Nothing that doesn't exist has mass. All we know about radiation is the energy of the emission event and the energy of the absorption event, which are the same and have zero separation in space-time. Now, this is not my idea. <laughs> now, let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. I'm unorthodox as a physicist. I'm unorthodox as an astronomer. I'm even unorthodox as a, as a monastic, you see. But I'm not unorthodox about the equations of our physics. The academic community is unorthodox with respect to their own equations. I'm not unorthodox with respect to the equations, only with respect to their guts. Their guts, though, are the same as mine. They're full of shit. <laughs> yes. Explain to me your idea that as particles get further out, they're going slower with mass and half. I thought the red shift was an indication they were going faster. <coughs> You see, this is not properly understood by everybody. Things coming toward you are blue shifted because of their speed. Going away, they're red shifted because of their speed. And if they come toward you, their mass is increased, and going away, their mass is decreased. But now, way back in the last century, in the winter of 1895-96, that's 100 years ago now, Swami Vivekananda, who represented Hinduism at the Parliament of Religions in 1893, <coughs> met Nikola Tesla at Sarah Bernhardt's party in New York and asked him, can you show that what we call matter is just potential energy? Now, he did not, he did not get it shown, but Einstein's first wife, Mileva Einstein, was a good friend of Tesla. And she wrote Einstein's papers in 1905. And very probably, she is the one who poked him to put in the appendix in which E equals mc squared. 